Who are they? Where did they come from? And what are the thoughts of self-proclaimed anarchists, past and present? And why, even though they're on file, are their faces a mystery to us? Why does their thinking seem so confused and their history so troubling? A child of capitalism, the brother enemy of state communism, anarchism is a wind of revolt that has continued to blow all around the world. And while certain libertarians turn criminal, wielding firearms or setting off dynamite, it's worth remembering that many of them offered alternatives and triggered revolutions across the five continents. The establishment has always come down hard on them, wherever they may be, dragging them in chains to the guillotine or strapping them to electric chairs. But punishments aside, any attempts to dismiss the actions of anarchists as mere hooliganism or to wipe the memories of their victories from the social consciousness have failed. While their practices have become part of the fabric of life, as their ideas eventually became popular, spreading and forming networks, seducing the younger generation from Paris to New York, from Tokyo to Buenos Aires, anarchists continue to fuel fantasy and sow misunderstanding. Whence then the smell of sulfur that precedes each of these somber processions? And what wild hopes are raised with every black flag? How can anarchism, which dreamed of an alternative future for the old world and has been fighting masters and gods for 150 years, still ask questions that are relevant to us today? And why is its history swinging like a pendulum, lurching from left to right, from insurrection to attempted murder, more than ever a reflection of our own? It all began in France in the 19th century. The country, like the rest of the world, was in the throes of the new economic system called capitalism, making its first tentative steps around the globe. The capitalist ethos was spreading as the landscape became pockmarked by heavy industry. But the mirages formed in the midst of the first industrial revolution soon dissipated to reveal a darker, more brutal reality. Attempts to answer the questions being asked by a new era steeped in contradictions soon materialized in the form of anarchism. What was the big problem with the 19th century? In simple terms, it was what was known as the social issue. Society was developing, rail travel, steam-powered locomotives, ships and looms were being invented. On one level, society was making considerable progress in terms of hygiene, medicine, and all that goes with it. And yet the appalling misery of those working in the manufacturing industry and what would become known as factories had never been so pronounced. All the great thinkers, Saint-Simon, Fourier, Proudhon, Marx, Cabet, Owen, and the rest, were striving to solve this contradiction. To understand the emergence of anarchism during this period, it's important to grasp the troubled and miserable existence of the proletariat, who had nothing but their muscle. Their working day lasted 12 hours or more, and the wage they drew for their efforts was not enough to stave off hunger. They had no day of rest, no insurance, no pension. Their children were put to work as soon as they could stand, and half of them died before the age of six. Deficiencies, epidemics, and alcohol wreaked havoc. Illiteracy was the norm, and accidents were rife. In 1840, the life expectancy of a worker was barely 30 years. And yet, just as the middle classes, enjoying the opulent lifestyle that came with progress, were able to forge their ideology and liberalism, the proletariat began to see a possible answer to the problems of the period and the socialism that was taking shape. But before it could provide a real solution to injustice, socialism had to first overcome another almost philosophical contradiction. From classical liberalism, the overriding problem in political philosophy was the reconciling of freedom with equality. How to ensure the widest possible range of freedoms with the greatest possible degree of equality, inasmuch as without equality, freedom remains incomplete. 
The ideals of freedom and equality needed to be reconciled. As an American anarchist said, freedom without equality is the jungle, equality without freedom is prison, and we want neither the jungle nor prison. This conundrum, the attempt to reconcile maximum freedom with maximum equality, this dual aspiration for both equality and freedom is one of the fundamental values of anarchism. Until midway through the 19th century, the term anarchism, from the Greek anarche, meaning absence of power, was a negative term used to designate disorder and chaos. But while major figures like Saad, Babeuf, or Godwin had been dubbed anarchists, it was Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, one of the few thinkers with a working class background, who used it to define a revolutionary political stance, and in doing so, invested the term with a positive value. In 1840, Proudhon wrote the memoir for which he is famous, What is Property? While the answer he offered to the question, property is theft, immediately caused a scandal, it was in the Declaration of Faith, a few lines later, that the true birth of anarchist thought could be found. It is a paradox that says it all. Well, you're a Democrat? No. What? You would have a monarchy? God forbid. Then you're an aristocrat? Not at all. You want a mixed government? Still less. Then what are you? I am an anarchist. Although a firm friend of order, I am, in the full force of the term, an anarchist. At the same time, while claiming to be an anarchist, he declared that property is theft, meaning that he deems property to be the basis of a certain social order, and to declare oneself an anarchist is to say, I am attacking the very foundations of the social order, identified as being property. Proudhon went even further, because according to him, there are close links between the political domination exercised by the state the economic domination exercised by capital and the religious domination exercised by the idea of God. So Proudhon truly is the father of anarchy, as he was the only one to connect these three forms of domination. He believed that they had to be destroyed simultaneously if the social structure was to be changed. While Proudhon advocated the destruction of power in order to change the social structure, he denounced revolutionary violence. His vision was for a mutual system underpinned by his People's Bank. His thinking, though, came under attack from all sides. He was criticized, lampooned, and outlawed. But his writings traveled, and his anarchism appealed to socialists all over the world, such as a young doctor in philosophy named Karl Marx, who proclaimed them to be the harbinger of the new European workers' movement. And even further afield, on the outskirts of Europe, in distant Russia, Count Lev Nikolaevich Tolstoy borrowed the title of a Proudhon essay for his new book, War and Peace. But it was with Mikhail Bakunin, a former cadet who went through every prison in Europe and was several times sentenced to death, that anarchism would become revolutionary thinking in the strictest sense. While Proudhon was the first to use the term anarchist, Bakunin was arguably a more important figure in the final wording of the manifesto, adding as he did the principle of revolution to Proudhon's ideas. He differed from Proudhon in advocating insurrection. He thought that the only way to uh, abolish capitalism in the state was through uh, an armed revolution. Bakunin began to spread anarchist ideas within the new International Association of Workers, better known as the First International. This association, set up in 1864 in London, established that the emancipation of the workers must be the work of the workers themselves, and gathered at its launch more than 2,000 workers, sweepers, laborers, guilders, carpenters, and joiners from all over the world. It was, in the eyes of the Russian revolutionaries, an ideal instrument for honing the anarchist project and presenting it to the world. 
At every conference, they discuss the means of production. Should it be collectivized? Is everyone entitled to their own means of production? Should it be shared? Were cooperatives and collectivities needed? What should be done about inheritance and money? What was the role of women and so forth? A whole range of problems that until then had never been addressed. But after the death of Proudhon, between Bakunin, the heir apparent to the mantle, father of anarchism, and Marx, who had long since split with the author of The Philosophy of Poverty, the debate went downhill. Their quarrel, as much personal as it was political, soon divided the socialist movement. Three major movements emerged. A somewhat minority reformist movement that dismissed the virtues of revolution, a Marxist movement qualified by the anarchists as authoritarian, which believed that an order would be established through the dictatorship of the proletariat, and finally, Bakunin's anti-authoritarian or anarchist movement, which advocated insurrection and final destruction of all state apparatus. For both anarchists and Marxists, communism was a stateless society, but while Marxists thought they could use the state apparatus of oppression to construct a new society, the anarchists believed that communism would come once the state was abolished in the social revolution. Marx thought you had to have a central political party uh, with, with a command structure that could uh, mobilize people in order to take power and then using that power create socialism. Bakunin Given the anarchist ideals he adhered to, given his mistrust of power and authority, Bakunin was convinced that such thinking was a colossal error. The thrust of his discourse was taking a leading revolutionary, put him on the throne of all Russia, and within a few years you'll have a despot. He predicted that in Russia, if the revolution took the form advocated by Marx, a terrible red bureaucracy would emerge. Standing almost two meters tall and with his clear blue eyes, Bakunin, who spoke five languages, soon won over influential members of the international, such as the Swiss James Guillaume, the French Elian Elisee Reclus, the Spaniard Anselmo Lorenzo, the Italian Malatesta, and a little later the Russian Prince Kropotkin. Thanks to them, anarchism became an international movement and the most popular revolutionary ideology among the various socialist currents. I think it's fair to say that if you counted globally the amount of Marxist members, you could probably scrape together about a thousand members, whereas the anarchist wing, as it, as it later on be, became known, you had much larger formations of uh, 60,000 in Spain, of uh, uh, 15,000 in, in Mexico, etc. Much, much more significant formation. With followers of Bakunin and Proudhon now in the majority within the international, many of their disciples could be found in France too. When the Paris Commune broke out in 1871, the anarchists were in the forefront. And along with the other revolutionaries, they threw themselves wholeheartedly into the insurrection. It was the great hope, the dream, a whole city suddenly becoming autonomous, ridding itself of its masters, of the old world, and reinventing everything. For 73 days, Paris rose up, shot a few generals, burned land registers, toppled the old idols, and returned power to the people. On the ruins of the old order, the revolutionaries within the international set aside divisions and together tried to build a better world. Everyone was supplied according to their needs, the poor were fed, the illiterate taught to read and write, and the disabled cared for. Church and state were separated, the arts became accessible to all, women were given an education, the vote, and control over their bodies, and the city worked almost without any government. In the real sense, the Commune was not an anarchist event. It was a first attempt at destroying the state immediately and entirely. There was the idea of a sudden uprising and the capture of a capital's economic and political life by the population itself. The Paris Commune may not have been anarchist, but those who proclaimed themselves to be anarchists, or those who soon would, such as Louise Michel, were in the front line. And when the movement spread to French cities such as Lyon, Bakunin himself took part in the insurrection. Within a few days, the state had been abolished. He believed the Grand Soir had finally arrived. But the government was already striking back. 
the communards raised the barricades and prepared for battle. In the course of a long week, in Haussmann's Paris, a civil war broke out in which workers, men, women, and children were pitched against a trained army. The ensuing counter-revolutionary backlash reflected the fear that the commune had struck into the hearts of the bourgeoisie. The troops fired indiscriminately. The pride of the proletariat was cut down as Paris became a mass grave. It was a massacre that's difficult to imagine today. The number of dead has long been disputed, 25,000, 30,000, probably closer to 20,000. Killing 20,000 people within a week, using the firearms of the day, would have been practically impossible. The killing ceased on May 28, 1871, because the earth, the gutters, and the sewers of Paris were overflowing with blood. The brutality of the suppression of the Paris Commune shocked um, many people on the left in Europe and many people, many Europeans in general, actually. This was seen as, it was a scene as a, interpreted by some anarchists as a sign that if the ruling class is going to behave like this, um, then we can behave how we like to. We can respond in the same kind of terms. They said this proves that you cannot have peaceful change because if you try any other way, you're just going to get massacred like the communards were. And if you tried to do things peacefully, they would shoot you down. Many anarchists died in the bloodshed, while many others were banished to the Caledonian penal colonies. The few to avoid death or the wrath of the state were condemned to exile and misery. With their numbers diminished, the Marxists seized the movement to expel anarchists from the international. But anarchism survived. Bakunin managed to flee in disguise. He gathered his last forces in his saint emilie stronghold in Switzerland in the Jura Mountains, sealing an alliance that would herald the official birth of his movement. At that time, there were around 15 of them, 12 young people aged between 20 and 30, who had come from Spain, Italy, and Switzerland. The others were a little older, Bakunin, along with the Spaniard, and Gustave Le Francais, a communard. They set up a new organization. Historians do not include them in the ranks of the international. This was a new organization. At least the name he gave it couldn't have been more unambiguous, the Anti-Authoritarian International. The National Workingmen's Association adopted a range of measures, foremost of which was a duty to destroy all political power. So for the first time, an organization with stated anarchist objectives came into existence. In Saint-Imier, by signing an alliance of friendship, solidarity, and mutual defense, the anarchists seized their independence. They drew up a charter, an organization, and a program. Organizational horizontality, anti-authoritarianism, revolutionary radicalism, internationalism, atheism, free speech, free thought, equality for all, and rejection of party politics. Every aspect of libertarian thinking was collected here for the first time. The anarchists even invented a new weapon, the widespread use of which would have the capacity to destroy any political power and launch a revolution. The main instrument of the revolution was the general strike. This was a new term coined in saint Imié. Trade unionism did not yet exist, much less the concept of anarcho-syndicalism. But everything was ready and in place. The aim wasn't to exist or carry on, it was to start a revolution. It was in the nascent United States of America that large-scale use of this new weapon would be seen for the first time. Introduced in the great waves of migrations, anarchism took root here too. Among the battalions of poor people who came to swell the industrial centers of the North, where wage earners resembled nothing so much as southern slaves, conditions were conducive to its development. In no small part because in the early 1880s, the Civil War dragged on in social struggles such as Pennsylvania's Great Railroad Strike, which the federal government countered by sending in the army. 
Bayonet charges claimed dozens of workers' lives. For newcomers, the American dream often turned into one long nightmare. The common story of immigrant anarchists, be they German or Jewish or Italian, they are either skilled workers who can only find unskilled employment or uh, unskilled workers who can only find the most demeaning of work. Uh, so they become disillusioned with the economic opportunities available to them. They become disillusioned with the political system, which they know vaguely is supposed to be democratic and republican, uh, but which they find in this time period is dominated by corruption, uh, by corporate power. And some of these disillusioned immigrants then encounter radical ideas. This encounter with radical ideas occurred notably in Chicago, a city that immigrants flooded into. Steel, concrete, and the meat industry needed manpower. Plagued with a rising mafia and the pay of the all-powerful industrialists, the city was overflowing with segregated workers, prostitutes, and street children. It was fast becoming the home of protest. Chicago was the center of uh, anarchist activity in the United States in the 1880s. It was a city in which labor relations were pretty harsh. There was basically no room for negotiation, no room for compromise. So there really, there, there really was a situation, the stark situation in which you had um, the workers um, often living in unbelievably harsh conditions and a local ruling class, a local, local business elite that was not prepared to make any concessions whatsoever towards them. Inspired by the new anarchist strategy, in 1886, on May 1st, then just a day like any other, a general strike was called. 340,000 workers gathered to demand an eight-hour day. The police broke up the demonstration forcefully. Walls became covered with calls for revenge. Two days later, the anarchists organized a protest in Haymarket Square. The event was to become a key moment in the history of the workers' movement. Few of the leading anarchists of the city spoke against what had happened. And during that demonstration, the police arrived in force. And at some point in that night, the police moved in to try and clear the demonstration. Somebody threw a homemade bomb at the police. It exploded, uh, killing and injuring several officers who then opened fire on the crowd. A few people were killed. There was a shootout. Police pulled out their guns and started shooting at people. Some of the people in the crowd, including, I'm sure, some anarchists, had come armed. And to this day, of course, Americans like to carry weapons around with them. The authorities decided that the anarchists were to blame, even though they didn't have any hard evidence. The Chicago police rounded up um, dozens of anarchists and arrested anarchists who they blamed for the event, blamed for the bombing one of whom had never been there, two of, two of whom had never even been at the demonstration that night. So this was seen as, this, in some ways, was the classic example of um, reactionary forces within a particular city, Chicago in this case, using um, an event like this to justify an exemplary act of repression. Eight anarchists were accused of throwing the bomb. In his plea, the prosecutor hinted at their innocence. We know that these eight men are no guiltier than the thousands who follow them, but they've been singled out because they are leaders. Gentlemen of the jury, make an example of them. Hang them, and you will be saving our institutions and our society. Of the eight, five were sentenced to death. Louis Ling committed suicide in prison. The other four, August Spies, George Engel, Adolf Fischer, and Albert Parsons, were hanged. It was only in 1893 that the governor of Illinois actually pardoned all the anarchists who had been hanged, and he actually blamed the police for it. He bl particularly blamed the police chief of Chicago, saying that he had organized the whole thing and that he may well have even been responsible for um, perpetrating this bombing. This generated enormous outrage, not only among anarchists, but even liberal-minded people, because the trial had been so unfair. As a result of the Haymarket martyrs being executed, they became folk heroes, not only among the anarchists, but among socialists all over the world. And so you would see their portraits in trade union offices in England and France and Latin America. 
As a result of the global impact of the Haymarket Affair, May the 1st was adopted as International Workers' Day. In the years that followed, demonstrations led by anarchists were held everywhere. But it was notably in France that the Chicago massacre heralded a new era of anarchism, one characterized by bombs and propaganda by the deed. Propaganda by the deed, with no specific perpetrator, is a spontaneous expression of revolutionary action. It doesn't have to be an explosion or a bomb, just an action that goes beyond words. The anarchists believe that heroic action was the best way to get the libertarian message across. So this challenged the revolutionaries. It wasn't enough to be a revolutionary who talked but left the action to others. Revolutionaries had to act and demonstrate their credibility through their deeds. A man named François Königstein, otherwise known as Ravachol, was very taken with the idea that action could create the revolutionary spark that would inflame the West. He followed to the letter the words of Louis Michel and Kropotkin, who along with Malatesta were the new theoreticians of anarchism, calling for unrelenting revolt through speech, writings, dagger or dynamite. In Nobel's new invention, Ravachol also saw the ideal way to destroy the old world, he set about learning how to handle nitroglycerin, and gripped by rage following the brutal repression of the very first May Day demonstrations in France, he decided to act. The anarchists decided to make May 1st, 1891, a day of conflict and action, not a day of orderly parades, as it has now become. As a result, brawls broke out in Clichy, where policemen punched the anarchists and the anarchists punched them back. Then in Fourmi in the north, police opened fire at women and children leading the procession, causing several fatalities. This prompted Ravachol to plant some bombs. Symbolically, Ravachol placed his homemade bombs in suitcases on Boulevard Saint-Germain and Rue de Clichy, outside the apartments of the judge and the advocate general who had condemned three anarchist demonstrators to long prison sentences. The damage was impressive. They didn't kill any people, the bombings. They were seen as um, uh, retribution for um, the um, overzealous prosecution of some anarchist demonstrators in Clichy. So basically the French, the French police and also to some extent the British police and um, the media in France and in Britain saw Rabachol, who was really not an especially significant figure, as being um, the face of anarchism, the dark face of, um, of his destructive creed. The myth of the anarchist bomb planter had been born. Rabachol frightened people. He was hunted down. The police acquired new weapons, while its officers reinvented themselves as scientists. One of the first anthropometric records in history was produced. His picture was distributed to newspapers, and his name was headline news all over the world. The four main newspapers had a circulation of between 700,000 and 1 million copies a day. And through their headlines, particularly in the Sunday supplement, they did their utmost to stir up a climate of fear. But generally speaking, the attacks did not, initially at least, outrage public opinion. In fact, Ravachol became something of a hero in the eyes of the public, in the style of highwaymen like Mandarin or Cartouche. He was seen as an avenger for whom a song was written to the tune of the Camagnol. There was a price to be paid for being a dyed-in-the-wool anarchist. Unlike terrorists, who make their attacks, then flee, 
anarchists had to confront society openly and justify their acts in court. They had to use their trial as a megaphone, ensuring that the anarchist message resonated everywhere, loud and clear. Faithful to the strategy of propaganda by the deed, when Ravachol was arrested only three days after his last bomb exploded, he assumed responsibility. At his trial, addressing the court of Sen, where he knew his life was at stake, he justified his actions. Currently, too many citizens suffer while others swim in opulence. The situation cannot last. Today, the anarchists are numerous enough to overthrow the current state of things. All that is needed for that is a shove, and the revolution will take place. Ravachol was condemned to prison for life with hard labor. But after a second trial for a common law case, he was sentenced to death. And so it was that one cold morning in Montbrison, his cry of three cheers for revolution was cut short by the guillotine's blade. His execution, far from scaring off other libertarians, acted as a call to arms. The anarchist press demanded vengeance. A veritable explosion of activity ensued. Everybody wanted to be involved. Urged on by publications that soon became known as the Dynamite Press, with their scientific exposés of anti-bourgeois armory, bombs began to go off everywhere. The restaurant where Ravachol was arrested was blown up. Augustus Valiant, the French Guy Fox, attacked the National Assembly. Léon Léotier wielded a hacking knife. Amédée Pouwels blew himself up at the Église de la Madeleine. The bombs of Émile Henry claimed several lives, one of which went off in the restaurant of the Saint-Lazare railway station. Also dynamited were Rue de Faubourg Saint-Jacques, Rue Saint-Martin, Rue de Vaugirard, it was a similar story in Angers, Loivre, Boulogne-sur-Mer, Marseille, and especially Lyon, where the violence peaked following the assassination of French President Sadi Carnot by a 20-year-old anarchist, a young baker from Italy. When President Sadi Carnot visited Lyon, Sante Geronimo Caserio seized the opportunity to murder him. Carnot had been warned by both police and anarchists that the blood of those who had been guillotined was on his hands, and Carnot was stabbed in Lyon. The death of Sadi Carnot was like a thunderbolt. He was given a state funeral and his ashes placed in the Pontillon. His murderer was quickly tried and sentenced to death. To ensure that his final resting place did not become a shrine, the remains of Sante Geronimo Caserio, anarchist and martyr, were tossed into an anonymous grave. But it was not enough, and the repressive measures increased. During this period, France adopted what became known as the Loi Scélérat, the villainous laws, which banned all anarchist and anti-militaristic propaganda, regarding it as a criminal conspiracy. This made criminals of all activists, including any poor souls who happened to subscribe to a libertarian magazine. This was staggering. These dangerous anarchists turned out to be a watchmaker from Saint-Imier, for example, who had sometimes yelled out incendiary slogans, but who hasn't ever shouted, hang them all or death to the police. Everyone's done it. The world was thrown into a panic. The craziest rumors abounded in ministries and consulates. The anarchists were plotting. They were a grave threat to the security of nations. Following the United States lead, governments drew up laws against the black peril. The idea of a terrorist conspiracy, um, an international terrorist conspiracy emerged. It was actually the first time the phrase war, against, war on terror was used. In um, around 1894, the New York Times talked about how European governments were, were planning to exterminate terrorism. Uh, this kind of language was used, you know, and sometimes it was quite melodramatic. To fight this imagined international terror, a very real international police force was set up. The governments of 21 countries organized an international conference for the social defense against anarchists, which laid the foundations of what would later become Interpol. 
In Rome in 1898, the world's governments gathered for the anti-anarchists' conference because every leader, king and prince, was terrified of being assassinated by an anarchist. But it was all to no avail because on July 29, 1900, in Italy, King Umberto I was slaughtered by an anarchist, Gaetano Bresci. He wasn't the only one. Despite the repression and emergency measures, monarchs and state leaders were falling like flies under attacks from the anarchists. The Russian Tsar, the presidents of Uruguay, Ecuador and El Salvador, the Spanish chairman of the Conservative Party and the Portuguese king and crown prince were all killed. Meanwhile, in Geneva, Luigi Lucchini stabbed Empress Elizabeth of Austria, better known as Sisi. In Madrid, the Spanish head of government was assassinated and so on, right up to the war, when Alexandro Skinas murdered the King of Greece and Guerrero Princip, the Archduke of Austria, and his wife. But faced with anarchist propaganda by the deed, the state fought back with propaganda. And for smart businessmen, anarchism could be used as a promotional tool, as was the case with Thomas Edison, who used the execution of Leon Cholgolt's murderer of US President William McKinley to promote his two new inventions, the 35 millimeter cinema and the electric chair. It was not that great in terms of casualties and in, ter in terms of the level of victims. I mean, some historians um, have said that probably no more than a hundred, um, not much more than a hundred, maybe less than 200 people were actually killed in um, the various episodes of anarchist bombings. For anarchists, by the end of the 19th century, one thing was certain. The strategy of assassination had shown its tactical limitations. Nowhere had it triggered insurrection, and the wave of killing had lost the libertarian cause a great deal of credibility. For theoreticians, it was time to get back to basics. By the um, end of the 19th century, many anarchists, including anarchists who had once accepted the necessity for propaganda of the deed, were beginning to reject it. They were, they were beginning to talk in anarchist journals that um, this strategy was not only not leading anywhere, it was actually counterproductive. Enrico Malatesta, famous Italian anarchist, said the problem is we have isolated ourselves from the popular struggles and the place we should always be is with the people and their struggles. So in the 1890s, after a relatively brief period, you had a movement of the anarchists back into the popular struggles and organizations back into the workers' movement, and then you had the development of revolutionary syndicalism. For several years, in many places, workers had earned the right to organize labor unions. But with the creation of Bourse de Travail, or labor councils, along with the CGT union in France, Anarchism and trade unionism combined to form a kind of revolutionary trade unionism in what would later become known as anarcho-syndicalism. From my research, what I really fundamentally believe is that syndicalism in its heart is a, an anarchist strategy, that it was born out of the anarchist movement. It wasn't something that uh, arose necessarily independently and that the anarchists adopted. Certainly the, the Bourse de Travail system throughout France structurally was a very useful system. The main champion of the Bourse de Travail movement was a young anarchist who made a name for himself opposing the strategy of assassinations. He's a man I have great admiration for. Belloutier was a Frenchman who died very young, aged 30, having literally worked himself to death. But he founded the idea of Bourse du Travail. What were these bourses du travail? As the name suggests, they were places you could go to find a job. At first, it was simply a way for those without work to find it. But pretty soon, the bourses du travail became schools, training colleges, libraries. It was where people discussed issues and developed their ideas. For a foreigner like myself, coming to France, I was very touched by those imposing buildings, and it's beautiful to think that the workers had paid for them themselves with their own savings. 
Those buildings were the embodiment of the social, political and economic ideas they were fighting for, places that stood up for travailleurs immédiat. They really represented a vision of the society of the future, establishing its principles and supplying the tools and weapons needed to attain their objectives. You could usually find labor museums there too, and they offered night classes. There were debates, conferences, shows too on Sundays, when workers came with their families. These were highbrow shows, so it really was the home of popular education. In giving a worker the science of his own misery, to use Boutier's expression, again we have the idea that an objective situation can be grasped. If the appropriate information is supplied to the people concerned, they will understand their situation and want to change it. The idea that the desire to change the world comes with knowledge of it is one expounded by anarchists and by Pelloutier. Bourses de travail began to spring up everywhere. Under pressure from workers, every town and city had its own people's palace. There were almost 100 of them in the early part of the century, and they merged with the CGT, which boasted thousands of union members. While not all were libertarians, far from it, they made Émile Bruget, a dyed-in-the-wool anarchist, secretary of the Confederation of Labor, a man who also believed that labor unions, not political parties, should play a central, strategic, and revolutionary role. It was the golden age of the trade union movement. This was direct action, or what I'd call self-sufficient trade unionism. It didn't need any political intermediary. It wasn't a case of having politics, elections, parties and votes for reforms on the one hand, and labor unions limited to handling nominal reforms or minor measures that concerned only the workers of a particular factory on the other. No. Trade unionism had to hold all the cards needed to radically change society. This idea of an all-encompassing labor union led anarchists to reject the ballot box. Voting wasn't about exercising a democratic right. It was a means of legitimizing the established order. At every election, the anarchists advocated radical abstention. They knew perfectly well that the vote was, in reality, no weapon at all. It changed nothing, inasmuch as even in the best democracies, the ten representatives of the people were not accountable to the people who had elected them. It was not a rejection of democracy, rather a protest against what was claimed to be democracy. So they dreamed up alternatives. The anarcho-syndicalist movement had delegates, but they could be dismissed at any time. It was another way of viewing politics. This was the new interpretation of politics. To effect change in the wake of the saint mihiel Congress, anarcho-syndicalist activists opted to use forged weapons. Thus, in the early part of the 20th century, the strike was the watchword. The idea may be simplistic today, but it was revolutionary. If all the factories stop running, how could capitalists get their hands on their money and dividends? There wouldn't be any. If everybody goes on strike, it assumes an economy of insurrection. Society itself would collapse without any need of extreme violence. Since the bourgeoisie would be unable to cope, you would be left with a stateless society, since the state would have no reason to exist. The idea wasn't to bang up the bourgeoisie and capitalists in prison. It was to kill them in the essence of their capitalism. If no capital is produced, there is no capitalism. Capitalism, though, kills, as was the case in Courrières in 1906, when one of the greatest disasters in the history of labor occurred. A fire damp and coal dust explosion set the mines ablaze. To preserve coal deposits, the owners blocked the mine. More than 1,500 miners were trapped by fire, gases, and darkness. Only 24 made it out alive. The miners immediately came out on strike. The women led the way, demanding justice. The anarchists were in the front lines. Clemenceau, who had just been appointed interior minister, sent in the troops. 20,000 soldiers charged the demonstrators. In response, in their 1906 First of May celebrations, libertarian CGT activists demanded the eight-hour day and called for a general strike. 
this was a foretaste of what was to come in 1936 and May 1968. While the Bourse de Travail set up soup kitchens and conducted the orchestra, they knew that a backlash was inevitable. These were tough times for everyone. As the workers made preparations, the bourgeoisie trembled and held its breath. The mood was feverish in this period around May the 1st, 1906, when the general strike was meant to begin. The wait was almost millenarian. Banners were waved. In such and such a number of days, we will be free. With the number updated as the fateful day drew near, the bourgeoisie was in a panic. And 45,000 troops were posted in Paris to disperse any demonstrations. So you had dragoons prowling the squares and clashes in the Place de la République. Soldiers charged with swords drawn, often striking with the sharp edge. The bloodshed was horrendous and many people died. Despite all the arrests, the wounds inflicted and the deaths, the anarchists carried off a great victory. They showed that they could mobilize the workers and press their demands. Although they failed to obtain the eight-hour day, the government was forced to concede a day of rest. The popularity of revolutionary trade unionism was at its peak. The Charter of Amiens, adopted a few weeks later, was a symbol of its triumph and remains today the pharmacopoeia of the trade union movement in France and around the world. In the early part of the 20th century, the spin-offs of anarcho-syndicalism were everywhere to be seen. The CNT in Spain, which would soon boast a membership of two million workers, or Fora, which would be the mainstay of political life in Argentina up until the 1950s, and the IWW in the United States, which adopted for its emblem a black cat and a sabot, or clog, of the type French workers would slip into machinery to break it. In many languages, it forms the etymology of the word sabotage. If you take a look at the map of the world and areas in which you've had uh, either syndicalist dominance, you'd find the whole of Latin America, significant parts of Europe. If you were to talk uh, at uh, minority syndicalist influence but significant, you'd, you'd find it parts of North Africa, into the Far East, etc. It has arisen everywhere around the world where you've had modern capitalist industrialization. With organizations springing up all over the world and publications appearing in every language, the revolutionary trade union movement managed to reach the fringes of the population that had until then been immune to political trends. Thus, the influence and impact of anarchism grew. When, when the movement matures, you find that there are trade unions, the anarcho-syndicalist trade unions established, and almost invariably they will have a section feminina, a woman's section. Now, this is not a woman's ghetto. It's that the section feminina was at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution. I think it's important to, to, to bear that in mind. So the, the pioneering work of women happened to establish this, this very strong syndicalist tradition of, of women being in the vanguard, if you will. Women were undoubtedly slaves among workers. They were at the forefront of these trade union conflicts, opening up new fronts for anarchism. Thus, the libertarian movement, at a time when women were not entitled to vote or hold a bank account, became the only revolutionary movement with female figures in the front lines. Women such as Louise Michel, the communal, who became a popular heroine, and Emma Goldman, the Russian émigré said to be the most dangerous woman in America. And there was Voltarine de Clare, whose literary talents were matched only by her fertile mind. Ledna Raffanelli, an activist who converted to Islam, and a leading anti-colonial figure in the Middle East. Or Virginia Bolton, who published the very first feminist newspaper in history, subtitled No Good, No Master, No Husband. Not to mention Lucy Parsons, whose husband, accused in the Haymarket affair, was one of the five Chicago martyrs. Born a slave, she became one of the pioneering activists of the black cause. Widely known and recognized, these women, admired by anarchist sympathizers everywhere, were feared by an establishment that was quick to lock them up, deport them, or even execute them. That was the fate suffered by Kano Sugako, a feminist journalist and Japanese martyr who was hanged in the twilight 
after being unjustly accused of high treason. Yet despite the involvement of these figures, the limits of revolutionary syndicalism became all too clear. Meanwhile, Malatesta, him again, lamented the legalistic direction the movement was taking and the fact that anarchists seemed to have forgotten what they were and what they were fighting. What Malatesta is critiquing is precisely this kind of apolitical bread and butter syndicalism that does not really contest power, that uh, uh, tries to muddle along and keep its head down and does not admit that at some point it's going to have to confront questions of power. This reminder of the ultimate objective of union action was all the more relevant given that in 1905 alone, the world witnessed a revolution in Russia, insurrectionary demonstrations in Germany, in Italy, and in the United Kingdom, Red Friday in Hungary, a rebellion in Crete, a general strike in Poland, Red Week in Chile, a mass movement in India, the start of the era of popular violence in Japan, the stirrings of revolution in Mongolia, and a constitutional revolution in Persia. Anarchists everywhere were on the march. But despite the widespread unrest, as with the Ilinden uprising in Macedonia, an insurrection that was both nationalistic and libertarian, all these movements were marked by bloodshed. Against this background of widespread repression, it is too often overlooked that certain anarchists took up weapons, as they did in the era of propaganda by the deed, this time fully aware that their actions would be in vain and that tragedy lay in store. Car notre sang bleu est noir, notre drapeau rouge est noir, notre étoile jaune est noire, notre vie en rose est noire, oui notre sang bleu est noir, notre drapeau rouge est noir, notre étoile jaune est noire, notre vie en rose est noire. Thank you.